yeah, so today I'm going to talk about search and information retrieval. Um, this is something that's been an interest of mine for many years now, and I was excited to learn that turns out some other people in the office seemed interested in it too. So I wanted to share what I know about search from a data science perspective. Um, so here is what I would consider the, uh, the big picture view of how search works. So you start with um, some documents or records. Uh, in this case, a document might include the words, uh, user-centered design is, uh, you're gonna go through an analysis step where you will uh, split it up into word, separate words, um, do some other transformations, and then you will index it. And then, then at query time, uh, somebody wants to know something and they might have a query that's something like user experience design. Um, it'll go through a similar analysis step, splitting it to words and other steps. Um, and then it'll go through retrieval where it'll use that index that was built to be able to very quickly retrieve a, a set of documents that will be um, you know, potentially of interest. Uh, so for example, if you, you might be phrase it you might be phrase it as you're looking for uh, something that has the word user or experience or design. That'll get you a, a set of documents or records to consider, but you don't just want some unordered set. You want things that are most relevant towards the top, so then you'll have a final step of ranking them by some measure of relevance. And then of course, whenever you do something, you also wanna have a way of knowing how good it is, like how, how useful it is. Um, and so uh, that will be uh, a, a piece that has a lot of the data science components to it. Um, all right, so let's step through these, some of these steps, starting with the analysis. So um, essentially it's, it, it involves text pre-processing steps that uh, involve, among other things, splitting the raw text into words or phrases. Sometimes you'll hear that re referred to as tokenizing. Um, then there's a step to uh, convert things to all the same case, uh, for example, a lower case. Um, there's a, some other steps uh, whose goal is to um, sort of normalize the text and, and get rid of the variation you don't care about. So one of those is stemming or lemmatizing. I'll go over that in the next slide a little bit more detail. Um, and then the old, in the end, you might also have some steps either at indexing or retrieval time, you might take into account synonym sets. And what I mean by that is um, you, you already know what words mean roughly the same thing. So both either at indexing and also retrieval, you might uh, either uh, say that uh, index it under both words that mean the same thing or at retrieval time, you'll expand the query to include other synonyms as a possibility. So then, uh, <clears throat> so then what I was talking about stemming and lemmatizing, it's all about reducing the variation that you don't think you're gonna care about um, and focus on things that do matter. So, uh, and it, the goal is to make your result set more inclusive and, and robust. So for, with an example, let's say you're interested in running and you, you write your query for running, but there are other forms of that word, including just run or um, ran, uh, you know, the past tense and so forth. And so you wanna be able to capture all of those. And there's two different ways of doing that. There's a, what's called a porter stemmer. Um, and that's basically a set of rules for truncating words. Um, and then there's something a little smarter called lemmatizers, which then uh, take a language model and a lemma is what you might consider to be sort of the, when you look in a dictionary, it's like that main entry. Uh, and so, for example, with ran, run, running, has run, all of that, they fall under run. So um, if you notice that um, in uh, the stemmer, it can just truncate, that's all it can do. So it can cut it down to run, but with ran, you can't truncate that to run. So it's still ran, but then the lemmatizer knows that it's just run. So it kind of reduces that variation that you may not care about. Um, similarly, but the flip side of it is sometimes uh, the stemmer may truncate something from normalization down to normal, but actually that's 
in some ways is kind of a word of its own, so you may not want to truncate it. Um, so those are just like, there's many other considerations in text normalization, but just to give you a flavor. Um, now, you're gonna want at least to get that set of potentially relevant results back fast, because uh, other steps are gonna be very slow. Um, so here, let's talk about the indexing and the retrieval. So let's say what you need to do is you're interested in either getting a, all the documents that have software and testing. Or maybe you're looking for documents that definitely have software, but it could be either testing or TDD. Um, and let's say the documents that you're dealing with, um, you, you've done indexing. Sometimes it's referred to as um, inverted index. And so you've gone through already ahead of time, found out the word software is that's in uh, documents one, two, three, and four. The word testing is in documents three, four, five, and the, the TDD abbreviation is found in documents two and nine. So then if you're going to quickly find the software and testing, then we're gonna take the, uh, the, the junction between software and testing, which the overlap is uh, three and four between these two sets. Now, if you're trying to expand it a little and you're saying software and either testing or TDD, then uh, we're going to expand it so that testing or TDD is two, three, four, five, nine. And then when you get the overlap with software, that's two, three, four. So very quickly, you can figure out, okay, uh, in the second case, uh, I'm starting out looking at documents two, three, and four. So once you can do that and do that very quickly, next we're gonna rank them. And the reason we wanted the index and retrieval step to be fast is because at this point, it involves pairwise comparisons. And so as you might have get, guessed, um, you know, if you don't do indexing and you're doing comparisons through everything, then it's a very computationally expensive problem. So the key with uh, data, data science tends to be that you need to boil things down to numbers. And how we do that with documents or records that are just free text is we turn it into term frequencies. Um, and so we can count up the occurrences of each word in the document. And so for the example, uh, so um, on the right, we can see a, I took a document and took the frequencies of uh, different words, um, you know, above and conceived. And you notice, you know, some of them are more frequent in that document than others. Uh, one thing you might notice is that, you know, function words like we and and are very frequent. But you might think, well, that's not that useful to me because they're in pretty much every document. So there are ways to sort of uh, take that into account. You can take words like that and just ignore them. Or you can do uh, what's called inverse document frequency. So that's, if it's in every document, it's not worth that much. But if it's only in a handful of documents and it's very frequent in this document, then it's important. And that would, case of that would be, for example, nation. So nation is almost as frequent as and, but it is not one of these words that's gonna be in every single document you see. And another thing to counteract the fact that frequency words or function words are so common is also to do the logarithm of the term frequency so that these orders of magnitudes of difference don't kind of blow things out of the water. Um, so now that we've gone through that, just as a, if you were not, if you have not seen the lightning talk version of this, I'll give just a moment for you to guess what document this came from. What's that? Declaration of Independence. Good guess. Another guess? It is the Gettysburg Address. So. Um, so once you have it into a, a vector of numbers, you can turn any document or query into numbers. That puts us into a, a vector space. And, and that's regardless of whether you're using this term frequency, inverse document frequency, or something else. And um, what you can do then is get geometric distances between uh, a document and a query, and that's how you can see how similar they are. So in this case, you know, you might, we might have a, a document number one 
and um, you know the frequency of and in the document is there's you know several ands but just uh, one dedicated which is this only one dedicated in the query as well so the vertical height is the same but the horizontal is less because of um, because uh, because they only has uh, fewer instances of ant. So Euclidean distance, this is as the crow flies, this is your normal, uh, you know, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, you know, finding the distance between the, the endpoints of these two vectors. And that's a form of distance. Um, the uh, challenge with that is that it emphasizes absolute counts. So in this example, um, you know, they could have the same, even the same ratio of the different words, but just one as a longer document, and that would force the distance to appear to be very large. Um, so maybe that's not the best. But one thing that I'll point out before going on is that you can have, uh, it's not just two dimensions. So here we're only thinking of two words uh, and their counts, but you could have hundreds of words in their counts, for example. And the same rule, you just keep tacking on and you know, c squared equals a squared plus b squared plus d squared plus e squared plus z, z squared. And, you know, it, you, you can do it in many more dimensions than you can visualize. So what could be better than Euclidean distance? Um, oh, just as an example of if War and Peace, if you're searching and the actual novel by Leo Tolstoy uh, is really, really long and assuming that it mentions War and Peace a lot, uh, those counts will be huge, um, but it, then the uh, uh, just a very short document that just says Woodrow Wilson was president during times of both war and peace um, would match better to this query because the count of how many times each appeared is the same. Um, so that may not be what you the behavior you want. So a different measure is the something related to the angle between these vectors. Um, and in particular, the, what they call cosine similarity. So, um, so let's brush off, uh, let's dust off our, our geometry a little bit. So the cosine of an angle is the, um, so we have, a, the so the, there's this angle that's between these two vectors. And so if you just take, I just kind of flattened some vectors here and we have this angle. Uh, the cosine is the uh, adjacent, so if you drop a perpendicular line down, this adjacent, the length of that divided by the length of the, vec the, the original vector there. So here, what we're seeing is, if you put those side by side, that the, the adjacent, that orange one, divided by the pink one, they're almost the same length, so it's close to one. So perfect similarity would be one. In other words, an angle of zero. Now, if you increase that angle, then uh, the same length of that purple line, um, but then you drop that perpendicular line down, you end up with the, an orange line that is much shorter. So here it's like half the length of the, the pink, the purple pink. Um, and so, um, so then the cosine similarity would be around a half. Um, now if they get really dissimilar, almost no sh shared words in common, um, then that angle gets bigger and the, the orange line is really short compared to the pink. And so it gets close to a zero cosine similarity. Um, so as you might hopefully uh, kind of see how the, the angles can be thought of and just, uh, uh, it's harder to visualize in many, many dimensions, but just understand that this same uh, logic works for many more dimensions as well. Um, so, Congratulations for making it through and understanding uh, cosine similarity because it's actually used in a lot uh, more broadly in machine learning. So essentially, again, machine learning and data science boils things down to numbers. And if you can boil things down like words to numbers, and you can also boil images to numbers, um, then it gives you a way for searching that way. So for example, um, you know, not just with words we're searching, but you could give an image and find other similar images. Um, and it follows the same overarching process that I'm describing today, so, which is you have to analyze that input into some kind of numbers and vectors. 
um, index them for quick getting some, roughly things in the same ballpark, and then do more expensive pairwise comparisons to find which uh, the you know what's most similar. An example of this is that you've probably heard about is called word to vec. So that's a way it's a, it's a model that was um, that that was developed originally by a researcher at Google who came up with a model to train these vectors of individual words. And so once you have that and you have nuance, let's say you want to find words that are similar to nuance. So you find, uh, you do a, 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 a cosine similarity search and these are the top 10 uh, words that are most similar to that vector. Um, and so as you can see, in this case, they used machine learning. It wasn't top-down knowledge, no like dictionaries. Uh, and it found words that are pretty, you know, that, that you can tell are, you would think are related to nuance, like subtlety, uh, profundity, um, and shadings, and so forth. And so that's pretty powerful. So I, that's not the focus of this talk, but I just wanted to, uh, now that I had gone over the cosine similarity, you actually understand, you can understand a lot of data science that way. And if you want to play with this kind of stuff, it's, it's, it's all open source stuff that's out there. Um, so we've figured out sophisticated ways of ranking the documents that we've retrieved. Now let's figure out how we can evaluate them. Um, so first step is you need to have some sort of evaluation set. Um, and so we'll, what we need for that are um, individual queries. And with each of those queries, an associated uh, rate, ratings or rankings for relevance um, and associated examples and determining whether it's relevant or not. And um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that the, the same set of documents have ratings across all queries. Uh, for example, this query one uh, has, uh, you know, this document four is only in query one and document nine is only in query two. But the important thing is that there be ratings associated with each query and certain documents. And it's also the case that, you know, more than one thing could be relevant. So in, in query two, there are actually two documents that are rated as relevant as well as others that are rated irrelevant. Um, so in order to evaluate this, we have these evaluation set. And now let's say that we want to evaluate, and we don't care about the, the ordering of things. We're just saying, you know, did we find things that, we, that are interesting or not? Um, and there are several new measures, metrics that are defined for that. So one is precision. Um, and that means uh, how much of what you retrieved is relevant. And this might be important in cases where, you know, there's no sense of certain things that you can't miss out on. It's just that, for example, on Reddit or other kinds of, you know, social media, you may not be looking for something super specific. Uh, you just find looking for something interesting. And as long as there's something interesting that pops up, you're satisfied. So that's cool. Um, so the, the flip side of that is uh, called recall, which is out of everything that is relevant, how much did you retrieve? And so with that, that would be important in cases where, where if you miss out on giving a relevant result, that it would be bad. And there are real cases of this. So for example, in uh, a process in law called discovery, if they do not, uh, so they're required in a lawsuit or a case um, to share all of the documents that they have from the company or whatever that they think is relevant to that case. And if they miss some, they get in very serious trouble. And so that's where recall would be a very important measure. And of course, as you might, uh, as you might guess, the, there are ways to combine precision and recall into other metrics if you want to kind of have a, a combination of those. So let's just step through this example. On the right, we have um, a line indicating things below it were not retrieved, things above it were retrieved. And so precision, again, is how many uh, of what you took retrieved, what was relevant. So here we have uh, eight uh, green pluses out of 10 things retrieved. So that's eight out of 10, so 80% precision. Recall is 
how many, uh, how many things are relevant. So that's the eight on the top and the three on the bottom. So that's 11 total relevant things that we retrieved eight. So that eight out of 11 or 0.73 is the recall. And the F1 score, um, just for your reference, I have the formula there, but, um, and, and it, they don't do a straight up regular mean, they do what's called a harmonic mean, um, but just to show you that you can combine the two. So now back to the question of, okay, let's say any search I do gives a ton of results. So then it's, the ranking is really, really important. Um, so with that, there are ways to still have metrics. And some of the ones from before, like precision, you can still define for the top K number of results. So let's say um, they're not gonna scroll through hundreds of results, but at least did, did we get, uh, is everything in the top 10 relevant? Another thing to, cons uh, so then we can cut those off uh, at some level and do those other metrics that I described. Another one is how far down the list of results do you have to go before hitting the first uh, relevant item? And so you imagine that, you know, if it's, uh, if you're doing really well, that first result will be relevant. And so this ratio is one over one, so it's one. But if you have to go down five items before hitting the first relevant one, then it's one out of five. So it's a 0.2 in this. Um, there's also some other metrics where um, you can imagine you want to take into account, well, sure, you might get the first one relevant, but then a bunch of irrelevant ones before more relevant. So you want to take into account, like, overall, do you have the relevant ones towards the top? And this discounted cumulative gain allows you to sort of downweight things that are lower on the list, and that, but then still give credit if, uh, if you have lots of relevant results towards the top. Um, it's hard, a little harder, though, because you need relevance judgments for more of the examples. So, um, sorry, it's jumping around a little bit. Um, all right, so now that I've described how some ways that you can uh, evaluate, what would be, um, what, what do you need to keep track of? Because there's nothing more heartbreaking than, you know, having someone who's had an application running for a while and they're like, yay, I think we're ready to do some data science on this. And they bring me in, and then I say, okay, what data have you tracked? And then they say, we haven't started tracking anything. And then I have to say, okay, start tracking and come talk to me in like three months. So even if you don't know that you're gonna use it right away, start tracking some things. Um, in particular, the user query itself, um, the documents that were shown and what order they were shown in, um, also, if the scores for them, if you happen to have that from whatever tool you're using. Um, the index, the version of the index and the analysis steps and the ranking settings that were used. Uh, any explicit feedback, uh, which they may give, um, and preferably not just this result set is good or bad, but this specific document, these specific documents are relevant or not, that's better. There's also some really interesting implicit feedback because you can imagine that it's a little onerous to, you know, expect users to constantly give feedback. Like, I don't, you know, you may not have noticed it, but in, even in Google search, there are ways to give feedback on relevance on, uh, on the results. But how many of us spend time doing that? Raise your hand if you've ever given feedback on a Google search result. I don't see any hands. So, yeah, you can't really expect users to take too much of that burden. So. What do they do? Instead, they do things like uh, that is implicit feedback. So for example, which documents did you click on? So keep track of that. Um, how long do they dwell on those research result sets before clicking on one or maybe revising their query? And as part of that, you need to keep track of uh, kind of the session identifiers um, so that uh, the idea being that if they go in, they, they may have just one information need in that session um, but if they do multiple revisions, that means that the first ones weren't doing very well. Um, the other thing is really interesting is that uh, there are even dynamic ways to take that into account, where if you, you know what their first query was and you know what their second query was, 
and you might be able to make the assumption that there are two different ways of getting to the same thing they're trying to find. And then you can have models that take that into account. So um, that brings me to another point, which is that search is an interactive experience. Um, especially, you know, thank, thankfully, Google has gotten so good, you usually don't have to revise your queries. But it, I don't know if any of you remember, uh, you know, before the pre-Google days where you're still doing online or library search, catalog searches, and you had to try like 10 different phrasings of it or different filters and different all this stuff. Um, the truth of the matter is that, you know, don't forget that you, you don't want to have too much burden there, but there are ways of tuning the experience, like faceting and filtering. Um, even, you know, even people who are spend a lot of money on improving the search. Uh, if I search for war on, um, on Amazon and it knows, wow, that's pretty broad. This could be a lot of different things. It could be, you know, it could be something from uh, video, music, uh, books, and so it, it knows that, okay, there's a lot of different categories these things fall into and give them the option to like drill down that way. Um, there's also a phrase suggestion or phrase completion. So, um, you know, Google's ability is uncanny to know exactly what, you know, if it's a three word query and you're one word into it and it already knows what you're gonna ask. Um, the open source tools are actually come along, coming a long way and being able to enable that as well. Um, and then also there's, you know, things like um, giving users the ability to specify what they're not looking for in very ambiguous cases, like, you know, it's Apple as in Pi, but not iPhone. Um, there's also a lot of user design considerations like pagination. Are you going to just show everything in one long running page or maybe show a shorter result list uh, or per page? Um, and that has lots of implications. There's also, if you think about it, uh, you know, a lot of what you might be building an application to search for is uh, maybe a semi-structured data. So there's some, you know, free text fields, but they're different fields. And so the, you have to think about, do you want one search box that searches all of those fields, or do you want to break it out to, you know, this searches for, you know, just author, and this searches for, like, the, the body of the text? Um, and then there's useful, you know, abilities like highlighting and snippets and so forth to make the experience more effective. So just in general, like if you haven't already paid attention to the search interfaces that you use, just uh, you know, pay attention a little bit and see what you find useful and get inspiration. So just to, uh, you know, most of this has been so far conceptual um, and I went that route because I, you know, in all of these concepts are used by all of the technologies that do any kind of search. But I did want to touch on the easiest ones that, that are easiest for you to get your feet wet with and even use in client engagements. And so here are three things you may have heard of. You may have heard of Lucene, Solar, and Elasticsearch. Um, to be clear about what these are, Lucene is actually used by both Solar and Elasticsearch. And the best analogy or metaphor that I've seen is that of an engine and a car. So Lucene is like the engine. It does the engine engine of, um, so it will do the, um, the, the analysis, the, uh, the indexing, the fast retrieval, uh, but it's just Java libraries. And so unless you want to like build some roadster from scratch and just start with the engine, then what you're really going to want is solar or elastic, which creates, uh, you know, like web server, web APIs, and ways to make it easier to integrate with a, a bigger system. And a lot of stuff works straight out of the box. Now, um, a couple things I want to mention. One, since we are at Pivotal, I do want to mention that um, our own Pivotal Greenplum database, which is a massively parallel database, um, has, we have a an implementation of solar uh, in the database called GP text. And so if you're in the case where you have a massive amounts of uh, data, including text that you want to be able to search through and mash it up with other, um, you know, fields and, and tables in your database, that could be an option. And another thing to point out is that with Elastic, they have uh, Kibana, which is um, more of a search dashboard and visualization, which is also open source. 
Um, so that's uh, you know a way to jumpstart what you're what you're doing, and not have to build everything from scratch. So with that all said, I'll, I'll leave you with uh, some references to where you can learn more about all of this. There's the uh, there's an introduction to information retrieval, which is it's a it's a textbook, but it's available for free online. It's written by Chris Manning from Stanford, among some other colleagues of his. Uh, there's also some books by Manning Publications, which, uh, as far as I'm uh, aware, there's no relation between <laughs> that company and Chris Manning. It's just a coincidence. But um, there's uh, some, some books that seem pretty good in there, Relevant Search, Solar in Action, Elastic Search in Action. Um, and then finally, uh, PCF has a tile for Elastic Search. So if that's something that you're able to either you know, is that enables you to quickly play with it or quickly try it out on a project with a client, then, you know, just for your awareness, I'll call that out. Um, so with that, I thank you for your attention and open up for questions.